Hello. This presentation will cover why incorporating multicultural and diverse children's literature in our Peace Corps reading programs and activities is an effective and important means to validate our students' and communities' experiences and enhance student learning. When crafting this presentation, I decided to share my personal experiences growing up black in the United States during the early 1970s because what I experienced was strikingly similar to what I saw transpiring in my host country community and classroom while serving as a Peace Corps primary literacy specialist in Uganda. This is my school photo. I am just five years old, third row up, and third child from the right. The similarities are many. I grew up black and poor, just like my Ugandan students. I was being educated in an all-black primary school, just like my Ugandan students. My school resources were limited, just like my Ugandan students. The color of my skin was denigrated, just like my Ugandan students. And there was little to no positive representations of my community reflected in the media, especially children's media, just like my Ugandan students. This lack of access to quality multicultural media can have lasting negative impacts on the self-esteem and self-identity of children of color, not just in the United States, but around the world. I want to mention that knowing the history of minority groups in America is not minority history. It is American history, and something that every Peace Corps volunteer, regardless of ethnicity, should know and share with host country nationals, as we are directed to do by Peace Corps Goal 2, which tasks us to help promote a better understanding of Americans on the part of the people served. For many minority children like me, when I turned on the television to watch cartoons, it was not unusual to be confronted by blatantly racist and stereotypical depictions of people of color. A children's program called The Little Rascals was quite popular when I was a child. In fact, it was one of my favorite shows. While some of the white characters in the program were buffoonish, they were balanced out by other white characters who were clever. The black characters, however, like Buckwheat, were always portrayed as one-dimensional and ridiculous. These stereotypical portrayals of blacks were also rampant in advertising, as illustrated by this very popular syrup campaign featuring the ever-jolly, grammar-challenged servant Aunt Jemima. So as a young black child, I was inundated with negative images generated by people outside of my community about my community. As young children, we looked to media for role models to identify with. When it came to black role models in children's media, my choices were limited. I had to choose to identify with the shabby, cowardly buffoon Buckwheat or the clean, pretty, cared for white child Cindy from the Brady Bunch. I chose Cindy. I had the choice of admiring the uneducated servant Aunt Jemima or one of the cool, in control, smart, and beautiful members of Charlie's Angels, one of my favorite TV shows. I chose Farah, the blonde on the left. My choices were also limited when scanning the bookshelves at the local library. The story of Little Black Sambo, first published in 1899, was immensely popular for more than half a century, and its lead character was hailed by non-black critics as the first black hero in children's literature and a book that portrayed black characters positively in both text and pictures. But change was on the horizon. A book that was truly worthy of being hailed as the first to portray a black child in a sensitive and admirable way was written by an author named Ezra Jack Keats in 1962. It's called The Snowy Day. What made this book revolutionary was that the author did not focus on the skin color of the lead character. It was simply a story of a boy named Peter who happened to be black, enjoying the first snowy day of winter. The illustrations are free of the stereotypes that were commonplace at the time. Finally, a child that more closely reflected me and my community. Here is a boy that not only I could relate to, but any child could relate to. Let's compare the unsophisticated, one-dimensional portrait of Sambo to this warm, intimate, relatable, and sensitive image of Peter. 
Before Peter came along, and many more quality multicultural children's books, TV shows, and films, I subconsciously internalized the nonstop negative messages about what it means to be a person of color that emanated daily from the media around me. Decades later, I am still pushing back against that early indoctrination. More than 30 years later, the problem of the lack of quality diversity in children's literature still persists. One 2012 study has shown that diverse characters are still scarce. In a survey of 3,600 titles, 3.3% were about African Americans, 2.1% were about Asian Pacific Americans, 1.5% were about Latinos, 0.6% were about American Indians. That leaves 93% of stories featuring white characters in children's literature. The visual of those stats looks like this. The literary landscape is even more bleak for children with disabilities, alternative families, who practice religions other than Christianity, etc., etc. So what impact does a lack of quality, diverse children's literature have on children of color? Why do we need diverse books? One answer is, we need diverse books because stories matter. If people don't see themselves in stories, the message is, you don't matter. So how does my story and the stories of millions of American children of color relate to our Ugandan students? Well, the situation is even more dire in Uganda. And you can see and hear how the lack of respectful and holistic representations of Ugandans in media negatively impacts the self-image of Ugandan children. When I told a Ugandan living in Kampala that I was assigned to teach in the northern part of the country, he exclaimed, don't go to the north. Acholis are very ugly, very black. When I enter shops in Uganda that sell baby dolls, very rarely do I see black dolls. You may say, well, there's nothing suspicious about a black child wanting a white doll. All children like novelty. If you are thinking this, imagine yourself in the States in an all-white community and try to find a store only selling black dolls. So why do Africans living in their own countries where they are the majority value Western ideals above their own? The answer is cultural imperialism. When a dominant group's political beliefs, science, laws, and social institutions, moral concepts, working methods, leisure activities, food, pop idols, religions, and ideals of beauty have become objectives, examples, and norms in less dominant groups. Simply put, nations that possess the vast majority of the world's wealth and resources produce media that values its own ideals and values. This media is consumed by wealthy nations and poor, white people and people of color. You then might also ask yourself, why is a continent made up of one billion people lacking creative and interesting entertainment for its youth? A continent known for its literary writers like Wole Soyinka, Meriyama Ba, No Violet Bulawayo, and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, to name a few. Why is Africa only importing children's entertainment instead of creating it? The answer is, there are African artists creating children's media for African children. A group of young Ugandan innovators are creating a buzz with a local cartoon dubbed Katoto. Richard Musinguzi, the creator, was featured on the BBC and aspires to be the next Walt Disney, not just of Africa, but the world. Katoto is the name of a Ugandan character who is a true village Muchiga man. He loves Bushera and is often caught in hilarious escapades with his son, his cow, and his wife. Katoto is not just in English, but also Uchiga and other Ugandan languages, and is the creator's attempt to keep the Ugandan linguistic cultural heritage vibrant. Nigerian animator Adamu Wazeris is also making huge contributions to what he calls the African media ecosystem for children in Africa. He is the creator of the animated series Bino and Fino, a Nigerian brother and sister duo who live with their grandparents in an unnamed African city. They are confident, outgoing, and funny. Bino and Fino is being held as Africa's answer to Dora the Explorer. In this interview, the producers of Bino and Fino interview a friend of the show. 
She shares her personal story about why she believes multicultural children's literature is so important in building the African child's self-esteem and self-identity. Uh, Melissa, what do you think? I mean, what was your experience like growing up as a child in regards to having black girls? Well, for myself, <clears throat> I really didn't have that many opportunities to really see, you know, even through like media cartoons and everything. I mean, the mega things that were popping or happening at that time were like Barbie, you know, Barbie's white, <clears throat> Cinderella's white. I mean, so naturally the kind of dolls, the kind of figurines and all those kind of things that you want or that you would see would be obviously white. So I remember <clears throat> when I was probably, is it like maybe five or six years old, I can't remember. But I went with my mom, we went to the store for Christmas time and that's when the like life-size dolls started to get really popular. Um, so I was like... <sighs> Mommy, mommy, I really want this life-size Barbie. I really want it. And I actually, um, my aunt actually was around with us <clears throat> during that time. And when we got to the store, I actually saw the white one. I was like, "This is it. This is who I want. This is my new best friend. This is this is my this life is, right that's here." That's the, the friend you wanted. In that's life. my friend. That's who I was expecting to be playing with her hair, wearing her dresses. And as I now grabbed her, my mom pushed her out of my hands, and I was. I was like, what's that about? She was like, why are you getting a white doll? Are you white? I said, mommy, she's beautiful. I want her. She's so pretty. Look at her hair. Look at her eyes. Everything's so beautiful about her. She's like, I'm like, are you mad? I don't. <laughs> Nigerian mom. Sorry, yeah, Nigerian mom. Are you mad? I said, no, mommy. You never see the black one, you know. And I was, to be honest, I was actually thoroughly disgusted with the black doll and that's kind of crazy because for me to remember something like that i mean this is like 20 something years plus hold on, hold on. you said you're disgusted with the black doll yeah what? you can actually feel that i felt disgusted because first of all i think it's two things i was i felt like it was being pushed upon me i could not understand why my mom why my aunts were telling me that you need to have the black doll the black doll looks like you the black doll is pretty you're telling me these things and i'm just like you're not right you're wrong because if she was pretty why is she not on television why are they not anymore why am i seeing only white um, cartoons or whatever it may be i mean you know so that's for myself i was like i think you're wrong i don't think you guys actually know what's going on she's not actually that cute anyway so unfortunately are not f fortunately unfortunately actually fortunately for myself my mom and my aunt actually won this battle and i did get, end up getting the black doll and i actually think um, I actually appreciate them now. I'm a lot older now and, and I've passed through a lot of things now to actually appreciate, you know, them and themselves trying to make me to understand my beauty as a black person, as a dark skinned person, you know. So I think it's it was really interesting because I mean I've seen other, you know, experiments that they've done before where they have, you know, black children, they ask them which doll is pretty, which doll is good and the same tendencies of always pointing towards the white ones. You know, and it's it's quite sad because you not almost have this like aha moment that's wow, there's a lot of self hate behind all of this. You know, it's just I don't know a lot of microaggressions that like people face growing up, and then you see it in yourself when you're now choosing that doll. It's like mm. it's it's really scary, you know. Mm. So, but do you think it has like repercussions when you get older? I think. I think. I feel like for my own personal, I can only really speak for myself, but I think if you don't end up having the opportunity or privilege, the earlier the better to know about your history, about knowing where you're coming from and everything, it, I think it does have an impact on yourself, on your self-identity and stuff, because I mean, you even see it here in Nigeria and even other Afro, um, even other countries that have a huge, like a large black population, is there is a sense of self-hate. I mean, there's a discussion about saying this color issue about bleaching not bleaching or whatever whatever may be pushing that you know but i do feel like a lot of people who are bleaching themselves is because of <laughs> the kind of access because of the experiences they've had in life i mean that's just the reality in, the, in my own personal opinion so i think it does have repercussions and that's why i do think it's very important for children especially young black children um if they're in africa especially in the diaspora as well where it's a lot of um, multi, you have people coming from different backgrounds, races and everything that they're actually able to <clears throat> have the opportunity to have 
um, programs like Bino and Fino that are able to educate them, make them to understand a bit of where they're coming from, what people like them look like, and actually show them that it's okay, the way you look is okay, there's nothing wrong with it. It's okay if your grandma wears a scarf on her head. It's okay if she doesn't make you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch because jollof rice is good. I love me some jollof rice with some plantain oh, yeah. and some beef. That stuff is what on fleek. So, yes. <laughs> I would now like to focus on my Peace Corps experience and discuss the original state of the library at my school in northern Uganda. It was in a sad state of affairs, stacks of dusty, untouched books covered in rodent droppings and many destroyed by gnawing mice. On the first day of cleaning and organizing, I came across this book, which I interpreted as my library's silent cry for help. As I cleaned, I found many books that could be salvaged, but I also noticed among the books I saved, very few were quality multicultural books. Most were published in an era where people of color were underrepresented or misrepresented. Many children identify with princesses, but when this book was published, none of the princesses looked like my kids. I was hopeful when I found this book entitled The Little Black Princess, but was quickly discouraged when I saw the pictures and read the story of an Australian woman trying desperately to civilize a young black girl. I found books featuring Africans, but they were about rape, AIDS, and alcoholism. The vast majority of the books about Africans were vehicles to deliver serious public health messages. I didn't find any that sparked the imagination, curiosity, or ignited a sense of escapism and play. So I had some sent to me from the U.S., not just books about Ugandans, but multicultural books in general. I found this beautifully illustrated book that takes place in Mali and chronicles what school is like for children there. It portrays children working cooperatively for a common goal. Not only do I read the book, I discuss more in-depth information about Mali. I do this to foster an interest and appreciation for many different cultures and people. So we discuss the country's flag, where it is located in the world, how the people dress and live. They love seeing short clips of traditional music videos and dancing, so I download them and show them on my laptop. I also download intimate portraits of children from Mali, which my students love to scrutinize close up. Another gem I read is this wonderful book entitled Ferdinand, about a Spanish bull that doesn't want to fight. It is a big hit in my classroom. My kids know the drill, so they demand to see the flag, see the kids, see some Spanish dancing. And in cow-loving Uganda, the big surprise was when I showed them some tame images of actual bullfighting. They couldn't believe their eyes. I also read The Five Chinese Brothers, which has problematic illustrations, but a great story. I debated about this one, but decided to read it, but made sure we also discussed how often people are not portrayed respectfully in books. I backed this up with beautiful images of China, gorgeous dancing, smiling children, and happy families. I equipped myself with enough diverse books to last my entire service. Give Up the Gecko is a folktale from Uganda, Another Ugandan folktale called How the Crane Got Its Crown was loved by all. I shared books about black Americans like The Lord's Prayer and used it as a jump off to discuss the black experience in America, not just with my students, but I also created a similar presentation for the teachers as well. Old Mikamba is an African version of Old MacDonald Had a Farm. And Pretty Selma is an African version of Little Red Riding Hood. I made sure to also include books that celebrated African features like their hair and the inherent beauty of all skin colors. And I didn't forget to remember the importance of gender equity either. Though books like these were in my library, I did not sequester them from my students. I simply made sure they also had access to books like these. Books with characters that prove that girls and boys are equally gorgeous and clever. 
I have kids in my schools with disabilities too, and made sure to include stories featuring children with disabilities who choose not only to survive, but to sur thrive. I thought it also important to share stories about real African people who have made contributions recognized by the world, like President Nelson Mandela of South Africa, and environmentalist and Nobel Prize winner Wangari Mathai from Kenya. I don't limit myself to just telling the stories of famous Africans whose stories have been published. I also write my own stories and share photos and videos of individuals who have not yet found themselves the subject of a children's book. I also wrote stories about the richness of their own country's heroes, like John Sintamu, the 97th Archbishop of York. He holds the second most senior clerical position in the Church of England after the Archbishop of Canterbury. I've written about the accomplishments of the brilliant Ugandan-born aeronautical engineer, politician, and diplomat, Ms. Winnie Bianyima, who is also the executive director of Oxfam International. Born in the UK to a Sierra Leonean father and a Ghanaian mother, Idris Elba is one of the most versatile and talented actors in the UK and the US. Not bad on the eyes, either. My children adore the short story I wrote about critically acclaimed, best-selling Nigerian novelist Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. They like the story so much, they enthusiastically wrote their own stories. Now all of my children are published just like Adichie. But by far, my children's favorite, I'm proud to admit, are two women who share physical features with my children. Alekwek, the supermodel and humanitarian from South Sudan, is a favorite. My children claim her as their own since the South Sudanese border touches northern Uganda. Last but not least, we have Oscar-winning actress Lupita Nyong'o, a stunner born in Mexico to Kenyan parents. When I learned that Lupita belongs to the same ethnic and linguistic group, Luo, as my students, I had to pump out a short story highlighting her accomplishments. However, both boys and girls prefer looking at her pictures. She's smart. Smart is a Ugandan synonym for attractive or well-dressed. The girls squill and the boys stare whenever I share images of Miss Lupita. I see the love and admiration in their eyes when they look at her and somehow know loving her means they are loving themselves. The value added to my classroom and to my service with the introduction of multicultural and diverse children's media has been incalculable. Sharing quality multicultural stories with our students bolsters interest in learning, raises self-esteem, and strengthens self-identity. There are no greater gifts that we can give them. In closing, I'd like to share several postings to the We Need Diverse Books campaign that further emphasizes the importance of exposing children to diverse books. We need diverse books because I grew up thinking brown men couldn't be anything more than a sidekick. We need diverse books because seeing a reflection of who you are allows you to understand who you can be. We need diverse books because everyone deserves to imagine a world that includes them. We need diverse books so my little ones will recognize themselves in stories they grow up loving. We need diverse books because we need books and media to give every reader and watcher and listener who walks into my library mirrors and windows to see themselves and to see the diversity of the world around them. Thank you for participating in this presentation. If you wish to receive a diverse children's literature reading list or would like more information on this topic, please contact a member of the Diversity Committee. Thank you, and I wish you all the best in your service.